the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Shortly after I got to my second parish, which was in Riverdale, Maryland, I got deeply involved in the work of the Synod. I became a close confidant of the then Bishop Harold Jansen. I was on the Synod Executive Committee and the Synod Council, and I was responsible for the Synod Stewardship Committee. I decided that I needed a little diversion from the bureaucracy of the church, and so I joined the Navy. <laughs> little did I know that I was going from one bureaucracy to another that was ten times worse than anything that I had experienced in my church. I got my commission in December of 1988, and I received shortly thereafter a letter telling me that I would spend the next summer at chaplain school at Newport, Rhode Island. Thereafter, I received a series of letters telling me that I should get in shape, that exercise was one of the components of being an officer and a gentleman in the United States Navy. Unfortunately, I ignored them all. <laughs> and when I got to Newport, I discovered that everybody else, save one person, had followed through and had taken those intervening months to get into some good physical condition. The other person was an old Roman Catholic priest. You see, in the service, even yet today, they'll take a Catholic priest as long as his wheelchair fits through the door. <laughs> so desperate are they for Catholic clergy, especially to minister to people in the Marine Corps. I had a staff sergeant from the Marine Corps whose job it was to turn us all into Navy people. He took his job very seriously, especially the physical stuff, so every afternoon at 5, we would go out onto the grinder, which was the parking lot, and practice marching around, and then after that, we would go on a run or do physical exercise. Now, if you couldn't do the physical exercise, you could drop out, but only after raising your hand. And so I would wait until the Catholic priest raised his hand, <laughs> and then I would raise mine as well. That summer was particularly hot. It was 100 degrees some days, and on one of those very, very scorching days, the Marine Staff Sergeant asked if anybody had problems with dehydration, so the Catholic priest raised his hand, and so did the Luther. <laughs> I, of course, was thinking that he would say, well, you're excused for today, when in fact he said, boys, you know what you're going to do. And we said, what? And he said, you're going to drink more water. <laughs> you're going to drink more water. Today, water plays an important part in at least two of our lessons. In our Old Testament lesson, we hear about yet another example when the people are grumbling against God. Three days after they had crossed the Red Sea on dry land, the people are in the wilderness and they have nothing to drink. And so they complain to Moses. And Moses is told by God to go to a spring and they discover that the water is foul, Exodus chapter 15. The water cannot be drunk, and so the people are annoyed and grumbling and saying, well, why should we have come out into the wilderness only to die of thirst? And so God tells Moses to take a piece of wood that he finds there, throw it into the water, and the water will be made clean, and so it happens. Shortly thereafter, the people now are hungry, having their thirst at least satisfied, and they complain to Moses, and God provides for them the great miracle of man in the morning and quail in the evening, and so their hunger is assuaged. And then after that, we have the Old Testament lesson for today, where the people are now camped out in Rephidim, and for three days they don't have anything to drink, and they're ready to stone Moses. And Moses knows this. He's a good reader of people. And so Moses says to God, we'll do something. And God says, well, okay, you take some of the elders of Israel and take that staff that you used to turn the water of the Nile River into blood. And when you get to a rock at Horeb, strike the rock and water will come out of it. And so it does. And the people are satisfied. They are able to drink deep of this new and refreshing water which will sustain them through their 40-year wilderness journey. It must have been a very difficult task. We don't know how many people were on the Exodus, but some biblical commentators suggest perhaps 5,000. Many suggest far more. But 
trying to feed people and give people water enough to survive was a difficult task. And he knew that eventually the people had to come to believe that God had the saving word to furnish them the things that they needed to take care of their thirst and their hunger. And in our gospel lesson for today, we have this wonderful interchange between Jesus and a Samaritan woman. The Samaritans ordinarily didn't speak to Jews, and Jews certainly didn't speak to Samaritans. There was a long-running enmity between them, going back to as far as the Babylonian exile of the Jews. And so Jesus is sitting at a well, and a woman comes by, and he says to her, give me some water, almost a command. And she's surprised that he's speaking to her, and she says, well, you, a Jew, you're asking for water from me. And Jesus goes on to say, if you knew who I truly am, you would ask for water, and you would ask for water which assuages not just your thirst now, but your thirst forever. You would never need to drink again because this water would be so special. She's no dummy. She asks, where do I find this water? And Jesus goes on to say that he is the source of this water. This woman's life was apparently difficult. We don't know what happened to those five husbands. Did some die or did they divorce her? And now she's living with a man who is not her husband and that certainly carried a mark of stain into her life. She's there at the well at noon because the other women apparently don't want her there early in the morning when they're drawing water. So she's like a pariah in the community. And she finds in Jesus acceptance and more importantly, she finds the water which will refresh her and give new meaning to her life. <clears throat> this past Wednesday at our Lenten Forum, we were looking at Luther's small catechism and we looked at that part of it which deals with holy baptism. We came to realize that baptism is not just a rite, R-I-T-E, or an empty act or something symbolic, that it carries with it real power. That when we baptize somebody here at the font, amazing things happen. Our sins are forgiven, we're made members of the church community, and we receive the gifts that are necessary to live our lives in God's grace. It's said that Martin Luther, every day before he got up and before he put his feet on the ground, would make the sign of the cross as the remembrance that he had been baptized in the waters of the font, <coughs> and say to himself that he was equipped to face whatever was going to happen to him that day. And then at the end of the day, before he went to sleep, he would make the sign of the cross again and remind himself that the day was past, that whatever had happened to him, no matter what transgressions had been part of his life or no matter how far short of God's hopes for him he had actually fallen, it was all forgiven and he could rest in peace to rise refreshed the next day. And that's what happens to us in the waters of holy baptism. It's an amazing experience when we know what truly is here in this spot. And how is it that water can do this? It's holy water. There's an old joke, what makes water holy? Well, you boil the hell out of it. <laughs> but that's not true. <laughs> what makes this water holy is that it is simple, ordinary tap water but to it is joined something very special, and that is God's Word. God tells us that in the waters of holy baptism, we find that spirit which is poured abundantly into us. And that spirit reminds us that we are children of God, having been adopted here at the font, we are made whole, and we are given away every single day to live in God's grace. So when you find yourself Feeling separate from God, what do you do? You drink deep of the water. When you find yourself living fully in God's life, you praise God by drinking deeply of that same water. It is this water which refreshes us even unto everlasting life. Like that Marine Staff Sergeant so long ago reminded me, what are you going to do? You're going to drink some more water. And that's what we do as Christians, to find life and to find life abundantly here in the water of holy baptism. Amen.
Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe. 